the signs of the times. The Antichrist. The Mark of the Beast. The War of Armageddon. The Second Coming of Christ. The Rapture. The Great Tribulation. The Judgments of God. We studied the book of Revelation. We studied the book of Daniel. Join the Reverend Dr. Dylan Toussaint this and every Wednesday at 7.30 for the Bible and End Time Prophecy. Probing. Intense. Troubling. The Bible and End Time Prophecy. Wednesday nights at 7.30. Welcome to the online Bible study series of the Edgewater Waterford Circuit of Baptist Churches in St. Catherine, Jamaica. And as usual, a special welcome to those viewing from overseas. May God be again glorified as we study his word. But before we proceed, let us pray. Speak, O Lord, to and through us. We come as empty vessels to be filled by you and as tools to be used by you. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayers. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, our study was subtitled Interpreting Matthew chapter 24. And of course, that came the week after we re-examined Matthew chapter 24 and by extension Mark 13 and Luke chapter 21. In so doing last week, we noted four main schools of thought in terms of the signs that were highlighted in the chapter. One, or the first school of thought, is that none of the signs actually point to the end of the world. In other words, there are those who argue that in spite of all these signs, and we noted six major categories of signs found in Matthew 24, this argument and the persons who advocate this school of thought are arguing, are making the claim, that none of the signs actually point to the end of the world. A second school of thought is that all, all of the signs point to the end of the world. All six categories point to the end of the world. And there's a third school of thought that not all signs point to the end of the world. So I hope you're following the sequence. First of all, there are those who are arguing and claiming that none of the signs point to the end of the world. Then there are those who are claiming that all of the signs point to the end of the world. And then thirdly, there are those who are saying not all of the signs point to the end of the world. But there, there's also a fourth school of thought that was noted last week. And this school of thought is a little awkward in terms of even saying it, but it is actually making the claim that it really doesn't matter. It really does not matter. Why? Because in the closing verses of Matthew chapter 24, Jesus emphasized the importance of two main things. Regardless of what we think about the signs and when they come and um, for, for which specific purpose they are shown, Jesus emphasized two main things in the latter part of the chapter. First of all, he emphasized watchfulness. 
And that word watchfulness or watch means being vigilant. That he's saying regardless of how one interprets it and regardless of how one sees it, the key thing is that the, at the end of the day, we are vigilant in terms of watchfulness. We are vigilant in terms of the lives we live. We are vigilant in terms of our soul. And then readiness. Readiness. He says, be ready. Which speaks of pre being prepared. Being prepared for his coming. Whenever he will come again. Be prepared. So whether we believe the signs, all of them point to the end of the world, whether we believe that only some of them point to the end of the world, or whether we believe that none of them point to the end of the world, whatever is our belief, Jesus seems to be saying at the end of the day, what really matters, church, is that we are watchful and that we are ready for his coming and so that was how we ended our study last week tonight tonight we are going to be examining another subtopic controversial topic in this study that we have embarked upon known as the bible and end time prophecy Tonight, we are going to be looking at one of those very controversial subject matters in this regard. One of those subject matters that have raised, um, has raised eye eyebrows across the world. One of those subject matters that persons have debated on and around for years. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the Antichrist. Yes, the Antichrist. And of course, because of the, the, the nature of this topic, because of the gravamen of this topic, we're going to have part one and part two next week, God's spare in our lives. So for this week, for tonight, we're going to look on part one of the Antichrist. Part one of the Antichrist. Now, Let's begin by looking first of all at the, at the meaning, the meaning of the phrase Antichrist. Now, let's start with the word Christ. The word Christ actually comes from the Greek word Christos, and it simply means the anointed one or anointed one. That's the simple meaning of Christos anointed one. So whenever you see the word Christ appearing in the Bible, it is speaking of the anointed one or anointed one. There's no getting around it. That's what Christ means. Now the prefix anti, A-N-T-I, has a twofold meaning in the Greek language. Now, the first meaning is what many people know, and that it is that anti or anti, depending on how you want to pronounce it, means against or the opposite of. Some people go as far as saying it actually means to stand in opposition to. No problem with that. But basically, it means against or opposite of. Of anti or anti in the Greek means that, and a number of people know this because we use that prefix often enough to understand that whatever comes after that prefix is actually in reference to the opposite of what it really is. But not many people know, I believe, that the Greek in the Greek word in the Greek language anti or anti means in place of, in place of. So on one hand, it means against or the opposite of or to oppose or to stand in opposition of, but also it means to, in, to, 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 to stand in place of, um, to, to actually put one's position 
um, and one's, one's, one's status in place of someone or something. So it, it's as if one is saying that I, I'm opposed to you, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm stand against you, and I'm showing this by also doing everything to take your place, to replace you, to stand in place of. That is what that prefix means. So when we talk about antichrist or antichrist, we are talking about one who is against or opposed or the opposite of Christ or one who seeks to take the place of Christ. That's what antichrist is all about. Now, I'd like for us to look on the references from the Bible in regards to this concept of antichrist. And there are a number of verses, passages really, that I'd like to share with us that directly refer to antichrist and indirectly refers to antichrist. First of all, there is 1 John 2, verse 18. 1 John 2, verse 18. And you're going to find that in the books of John, um, 1 John and 2 John, uh, Antichrist appears more often than others. In fact, this is the only part of the Bible where the word actually is located. So 1 John 2, verse 18, it says, Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists or Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. So right there you are seeing two references to the word in the 1 verse 18 of 1 John chapter 2. Also, 1 John 2, verse 22, it goes on to state, Who is a liar? But the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist. The one who denies the Father and the Son. So here again we are seeing the Antichrist or the Antichrist mentioned in 1 John 2, this time verse 22. Who is a liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. And then in 1 John 4, verse 2 to verse 3, we also have references to the Antichrist. It states, this is how we can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that denies, that does not, sorry, acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit, the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. An interesting verse there, wouldn't you say? Every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. Moving on, there's also 2 John 7. Remember now that it has no verses, so it has no, no, no chapters, I should say, only verses, so... 2 John chapter 7 states, I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as come in the, in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist or antichrist. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Interesting. Now, those four verses actually reference directly the word Antichrist. Now we're going to look on passages that do not directly mention Antichrist or Antichrist, 
but are obvious references to the Antichrist. And I'm speaking of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 through to verse 10. And reading from the NIV, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1 to 10. It reads as follows. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day will not come until the rebellion occurs. And the King James says, the falling away, falling away occurs. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped. So that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. And all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Interesting stuff there. Um, I dare say frightening stuff when you read it in its fullness. But even more frightening is the information we get from Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, verse 11, sorry, through to verse 15. Revelation 13, verse 11 through to verse 15. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Because of the signs, it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast. It deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. To be killed. So, in 2 Thessalonians 2 and Revelation 13, no direct mention is made of the Antichrist. But indirectly, it is obvious that the reference points to that Antichrist. So, we have looked on the meaning. We have looked on the references. The third thing I want us to note tonight and it's the final thing as we explore this whole matter of the Antichrist. I want us to look on identity. Identity. 
how do we identify the Antichrist from a biblical perspective? Now, mistakenly, many persons have sought over the years, and many years I should say, to identify the following persons as the Antichrist. And, and, and you know them. Um, some you perhaps didn't know. But it started all the way back in, in, in Bible days. Um, Roman emperors such as Nero and Titus and Domitian were based on the records regarded as the Antichrist because of how evil they were, how ruthless they were, how opposed to God's people they were. And therefore, there are those who have said that in those days, many persons, including Christians, no doubt, thought that these Roman emperors were really the Antichrist. Of course, there's also Hitler. Remember Hitler? Germany. The Holocaust. And, and there's no doubt that the Jews who were around in that time, in, indeed, there are many Jews today who perhaps still believe that Hitler was the literal manifestation and representation of the Antichrist. There are those who also talk about Mussolini. There are those who argue that the popes, successive popes of the Catholic Church, are the Antichrist. And haven't you heard the arguments? That almost every pope that comes is the Antichrist, and they come and they die, and then they start with a new one. And there are those who have gone as far as claiming that some U.S. presidents... <laughs> Are or embody the Antichrist. Those are some of the mistaken views, opinions, thoughts that have circulated over the years in regards to the Antichrist. However, beloved, let's look at the Bible and let's look in the Bible. In the Bible, the identity of the Antichrist is shrouded in mystery and shrouded in mystique. Shrouded in mystery and in mystique. Now, whether intentionally or incidentally, the aforementioned Bible references give mixed signals as to whether the Antichrist should be regarded as the following. Mixed signals. And I'm saying this, whether it is intentional or incidental, there are mixed signals that the Bible give in this regard. And we need to acknowledge this. On one hand, one is not sure when you read the the references that we noted earlier, whether the Antichrist or Antichrist is plural or singular. Let's look, for example, at two verses coming out of 1 John that we read earlier. 1 John 2 verse 18 again. Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard, that the Antichrist is coming even now, many antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. Many antichrists have come. Verse 22 of chapter, 20, of chapter 2. Who is a liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the antichrist. And now this is saying the one who denies the father and the son. Verse 18 mentioned many this one is talking about the one. Which is it? Plural or singular? Plural or singular? And then, 
there seem to be some mixed messages in terms of whether the Antichrist is a spirit or whether the Antichrist is a person. Let's look again at two verses from the references given earlier. 1 John 4 verse 3, the first part of verse 3. It states, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit, the spirit of the Antichrist. The spirit of the Antichrist. Let's look on 2 John 7. I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Watch this now. Any such person is the deceiver and the Antichrist. Any such person. Now, 1 John 4, 3 mentioned the spirit. This one is mentioned in the person. And when you, when you fast forward to 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, that was also referenced earlier. It states, Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs. And the man, the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. So on one hand, we're getting the impression that the Antichrist is a spirit, the spirit of the Antichrist. Now, we also see that it points to a person. Which is it? Which is it? Stay tuned. For next week, we're going to seek to unravel some of these mysteries and questions. And, and then, finally, there's the concern of whether the Antichrist is present or future. In 1 John 4 verse 3, it says, But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, is coming. And then it goes down to say, even now is already in the world. Is coming on one hand, and the next hand it says, is already in the world. Which is it, present or future? Some people might even ask, is it past? But these are some of the mixed messages, beloved, that we see in the scriptures when it comes down to this concept of Antichrist. Of Antichrist. So is it plural or singular? Is it a spirit or is it a person? Is it present or future reality? Don't miss next week, God's willing. We are going to see if we can further unravel the mysteries and mystique surrounding the Antichrist. But tonight I just sought to whet your appetite. Just sought to lay a foundation, just sought to intrigue you as we seek to delve deeper into God's word. Is the Antichrist plural or singular? Is the Antichrist a spirit or person? Is the Antichrist present or a future reality? Some takeaways, some takeaways before I leave you tonight. The first takeaway is this, the Antichrist, is essentially anything or anyone who stands against, opposite to, or in place of Christ. That's the Antichrist. So, um, whether we want to give Antichrist a human designation or spiritual one or not, when push comes to shove, when we reach down to grass tacks, when the rubber meets the road, The Antichrist is essentially anything or anyone who stands against, opposite to, or in place of Christ. We'll talk about that some more next week. Second takeaway, the identity, the identity of the Antichrist will be eventually revealed. But until then, will remain a mystery and a mystique. I want us to bear that in mind. That with all the speculations that people have been given over the years, it seems to me that at least from a biblical perspective, the Antichrist will eventually be revealed. But until then, remains a mystery 
and the mystique. There are, there are, there are three sets of questions I'd like to leave with us tonight for us to ponder over the next couple of days. And again, I, I, I remind you, don't miss next week, God's willing. Do you believe, do you believe that Antichrist is a plural or single reality? Do you believe that Antichrist is a spirit or a person? Do you believe that the Antichrist is already here or is to come? What is your belief in that regard? Remember now, I have left the door open for you to ponder these things. Next week, God's willing, we seek to address and answer these questions in a more fulsome manner. But for the time being, what is your belief, beloved, in regards to these three things? As usual, I'm going to ask you please to send your questions or comments to the following email address. Bible End Time Prophecy 2021 at gmail.com. Bible End Time Prophecy 2021 at gmail.com Would you bow your heads and your hearts with me as I pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can once again explore and examine your word. We ask now, good Lord, that you will indeed continue to speak to us over these coming days as we continue to wait upon you and to depend upon you in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us. We will hope you'll join us again right here on our YouTube channel as we look at the Bible and End Time Prophecy. Remember to send in your questions or comments to BibleEndTimeProphecy2021 at gmail.com. Please remember to pray for each other. Have a blessed week in the Lord.